We're just going to take a look at some of the brain anatomy in this lecture. So the brain has three main parts. There's the forebrain, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. So let's just take a look at a picture. So the forebrain is the largest part of the brain. So this is the forebrain. And the forebrain is divided into two halves. So we have the right and the left hemisphere. And the two hemispheres of the brain will communicate to, with each other through the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum, that's just a bundle of myelinated axons that will take messages back and forth between the two. Um, the word corpus callosum, corpus means body, and callosum means thick. So just a description of what it looked like. Um, the next part we have is the cerebellum on the back part of the brain. It got its name. Um, cerebellum actually means little brain because they thought it looked like a small miniature brain on the back there. And then we have the brain stem, which will then go into the spinal cord. We can further subdivide the three parts of the brain. So the forebrain we can divide into the cerebrum and the diencephalon. The cerebrum is then further divided into the cerebral cortex and the basal nuclei. And then the diencephalon is going to be divided into the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And then the brain stem we can subdivide into the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. So here's just the divisions. So the forebrain will divide into the cerebrum, which is most of this. And then the diencephalon, the word diencephalon, di means between, and encephalo means brain. So it literally means the part that's in between the brain. Um, so that would include the thalamus, which is right here. And then the hypothalamus, which we've talked about before, which is located right below the thalamus. And then we have the brainstem, which we're going to divide into the midbrain. So the very top of the brainstem is the midbrain. And then right below that is the pons. And the way I remember that is the pons pooches out. So I just remember pons and pooch. <laughs> they both have a P, and that's how I always remember that one. And then the medulla oblongata is the bottom part of the brainstem, and then that joins in with the spinal cord. Looking at the cerebral cortex, um, anytime you see the word cortex, that means outer. So the outer portion of the cerebrum, that's the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex, that is all gray matter. And remember, gray matter, that's where all the synapses are occurring. Okay, so this is where all the neural processing is going on, um, where you're thinking, making decisions, sensory information coming in, uh, motor signals going out. So there's a lot of things going on there. Um, so cerebral cortex has a lot of different jobs. Um, so this is where you're perceiving your environment, all that sensory information coming in. Um, you're making your ideas, thinking of things, recalling memories in the cerebral cortex. Um, also, this is where your uh, brain is controlling your body movements, and it's just a big integrating center. We have some different lobes of the cerebral cortex, and we'll just take a look at pictures of this. The frontal lobe in purple is what's right behind your forehead and kind of on the, the top of your head here. And that's going to be responsible for giving you your personality. It's where you're going to be thinking, planning things, and also your motor cortex is here. So that's going to be controlling the movements of your skeletal muscles as well. The parietal lobe, uh, right behind the frontal lobe, uh, that's just kind of on the top back of your head there. And that's where all of the sensory information um, from touch, pain, temperature, you know, as far as if you're feeling something hot or cold, all of that information is going to be coming into that parietal lobe. The occipital lobe at the very back, that's where vision will come in. 
So all of the information from your eyes will go to the back there to the occipital lobe. The temporal lobe, uh, that's by your temples. So right above your ears, that's where your temporal lobe would be located. So um, hearing will go to your temporal lobe and then also smell will go to the temporal lobe. So these are just um, some of the different areas that we're going to be talking about in the cerebrum as we go through chapter nine. And um, some of these we'll talk about later, like Wernicke's area for understanding and comprehending um, spoken and written language. Um, that's in orange here. And then we're also going to be talking about Broca's area in pink here. Um, and that's going to be telling your muscles in your mouth and your lips and tongue how to move so you can uh, form words and so people could actually understand you. Um, so we'll be talking about those as we go along. Okay, so let's take a look at the primary motor cortex and the primary somatosensory cortex. So these are two really important areas of the brain. And if we take a look at a picture, where the primary motor cortex is located. So this is in the light purple area here. This is the very back of the frontal lobe. This is where the primary motor cortex is located. And what's interesting is the neurons that are going to go down to the spinal cord and then they will synapse onto the motor neurons that will then innervate the skeletal muscle they all have a certain area of the primary motor cortex where they're gonna be found. So it's very well organized. So for example, the uh, upper motor neurons that are gonna control your facial muscles and your mouth muscles, they're all located here in the primary motor cortex. Um, whereas the upper motor neurons that control the muscles in your hands they're in this area of the primary motor cortex. So everything is, is very well organized. Um, and notice that the, the body does not have equal representation. So we have a lot more motor neurons going to our face and also to the muscles in our hands than we do to other areas of the body. But if you think about it, we have very fine muscle movements to make our facial expressions and also to be able to form words and speak. And also we need very fine muscle movements um, in order to use our hands as well. So we're gonna devote more space to those areas than other places in the body. And we do the same thing in this primary somatosensory cortex. This is located in the parietal lobe, um, which is right here in blue. So at the very front of the parietal lobe, that's where the primary somatosensory cortex is. And this is where all the sensory information is coming in from touch, um, coming in from proprioception, like do you know like the position of your leg? Is it bent? Is it straight? Um, information about pain, about temperature. All of that's coming into that primary somatosensory cortex. And again, we have different areas devoted to different body parts. So you can see all of the sensory information coming in from your face will be coming into this area, the primary somatosensory cortex. And then information coming in from your fingers and your hand will be coming in here and you can see all the other body parts um, located in different areas. So things are very well organized. And again, we don't have equal representation of each body part. So you can see we have a lot more space devoted to our face and especially our lips um, and also to our hands. And if you think about the most sensitive areas on our body um, are definitely our lips. Um, face and then also your fingers okay those are the most sensitive to to touch and so you have a lot more sensory neurons that are bringing information um, from those areas to the primary somatosensory cortex 
So this is what's called a sensory homunculus. Homunculus means little man. And this is what your brain thinks your body looks like. Okay, it's pretty funny looking, but um, looking at that representation, um, you know, how much space is devoted in your primary somatosensory cortex to the different areas of the body, you know, we have a lot more space devoted to, you know, touch for like our lips and our face and our hands than we do to other parts of the body. Um, and so this is what our brain thinks our body looks like. Okay, so that is a sensory homunculus. And I'm really glad that we don't actually look like that. And okay, we also have brain lateralization. Um, so because we have two hemispheres, um, we have the right and left hemisphere. And what's interesting is that the sensory and motor pathways will cross or decussate. Um, so like if you poke your left finger on a thorn, that sensory information will travel up to the right hemisphere. And that's where that information will go. And then the right hemisphere will then send motor signals down to your left arm to tell you to pull your left arm back. Okay, so that's all going to be crossed. Okay, so we call that, um, we say that it decussates. Okay, so that's the, the name we use for crossing. Um, so the brain um, does have different specializations in one hemisphere versus another. Um, the right hemisphere is specialized, it's more um, your creative, artistic ability is, is more located on the right side, and also spatial perception, so like your depth perception, you know, how far away is that car in front of you, um, you know, recognizing face, faces or body language, you know, that's all on the right side. Your, your sense of intuition, like, oh, something's not right, um, that's coming from your, your right hemisphere as well. Whereas your left hemisphere, um, it's more specialized, it's much more the logical part of the brain. It's um, very good at, you know, balancing checkbooks and doing math problems, um, you know, more analytical type problems. And your language um, centers, for most people, that's going to be located on the left side as well. And this is just kind of an interesting picture to, to look at, um, just showing you just some of the specializations of, of the hemispheres, you know, because some things are better on one side than another. So like on the right side, we're much better um, at um, spatial analysis. So, you know, judging, you know, how far away something is and also, you know, analysis by touch. So like if you were to reach into a grab bag and you're, feeling an object and you're trying to decide what it is just by touch without looking at it, that's the right hemisphere that, that's allowing you to do that. Okay, left hemisphere is not so good at that, but right hemisphere is pretty good at that. Um, and then your language interpretation and um, speech centers, for most people that's on the, the left side of the brain is um, for most people. Um, but the two hemispheres do talk to each other through that corpus callosum. You've just got those myelinated axons bringing messages back and forth, so each side knows what the other side is doing. Okay, last structure we're going to talk about are the basal nuclei. Okay, and remember in the central nervous system, the nuclei, these are just clusters of neuron cell bodies, these islands of gray matter deep inside the white matter. And the basal nuclei, um, they're going to be involved in movement. So they're going to stop you from doing movements you don't want to do. So like you wouldn't want to be flinging your arm around when, when you want it to be quiet. So your basal nuclei would tell your arm don't move when you're not supposed to. And it would tell you to start moving when you're supposed to. So like if you want to start walking, the basal nuclei would start you walking. Okay, and then it's also involved in, in your postural support and, and helping keeping you upright as well. Okay. All right, and this is just a, uh, looking at a cross section of the brain. And the basal nuclei, um, you can see these little islands of gray matter here. 
Um, there's a couple of basal nuclei there, and then there's one up here, and then we've got the same thing on the other side. Okay, and so these basal nuclei just they they wrap around the thalamus. The thalamus is is right in the very middle of the brain there. Um, and so the basal nuclei, they just kind of wrap around the, the thalamus there. Yeah, and it's just kind of a nice three-dimensional view of the basal nuclei. Um, you can see the thalamus in purple, and you can see how the basal nuclei kind of wrap around um, that. And so just I want you to remember that the basal nuclei, they're involved in, in movement. Okay, so they're involved in um, adjusting your movements, you know, making sure you're not doing movements you don't want to do, and then starting your movements. Um, sometimes you'll see the basal nuclei called basal ganglia. Um, that's an older term. Um, but remember ganglia, we use that term in the peripheral nervous system and not in the central nervous system, but sometimes you'll still see that term used, but, we, but it's supposed to be the basal nuclei. So.